We've had an amazing few months here on Upfront and we're not far from 100,000 subscribers. Once we've hit that landmark, one of our lucky 100,000 will be offered an opportunity to come in the studio here to watch a recording of the show. I'll show you behind the scenes, you'll be able to meet a guest and you'll be able to bring a mate along. To be in with a chance of winning, make sure you subscribed and leave a comment below on this episode. We'll pick one winner at random once we've hit 100,000 subscribers. So best of luck. When you look at United now with Onana, what do you make of him? At this point, he's so, he's so insecure because he's now feeling what Manchester United is. It's that pressure down on your shoulders, mm -hmm. right? And it's difficult sort of to get up from that. I got picked on a lot. And you've spoken to Bruce this morning. Bruce got picked on a lot. You know, Inzi got picked on a lot. I mean, by the manager. By the manager. Yeah. And I want to read you a quote from Roy Key, which is, Peter Schmeichel was a poser. And then you've got another one from Paul Parker that says, you're a little bit of a coward. When you listen to those, <laughs> what, do you, what, what, do you, what do you make of them? This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a standout amongst football's greatest goalkeepers. He was a stalwart in a period of dominance for Man United collecting multiple Premier League titles and FA Cups before culminating with the famous treble in 1999. 180 clean sheets in his time at Old Trafford, a bane to a host of strikers, the great Dane, Peter Schmeichel. Welcome to Upfront. Thank you, Simon. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I Thanks think, for that. I think uh, the last time I saw you was in Qatar. Yeah, it was, yeah. Our paths crossed and you, I think you made an observation that someone had mistaken me for you or you for me. So we were in the same hotel. Right. Yes, we were. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I came over and said hello. And he said that somebody had mistaken you for me. Right. So what did you think so, to that? No, I, I should ask you. What do you think to it? Well, I, I saw what you was wearing at the time, so I wasn't overly flattered by it. <laughs> so funnily enough, I thought the same. <laughs> I didn't like those flip-flops, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wear bloody flip-flops. I spoke to Brucey today about you because um, um, I wanted to get a little bit of background and he was saying that when you first came to United you know you didn't know where to live and he, you came around to his house for a cup of tea and then bought the house bloody next door to him yeah yeah we were neighbours for five years I yeah. think yeah he said he was um, yeah he became very him and his family Jan yeah, uh, Janet, Janet and, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, Alex, and, and yeah. Alex and Alex and, and Amy. Because Alex they is big be friends with your son Casper right yeah yeah and, yeah, and Amy and, and my daughter Cecilia as well um, but they became very, very important mm. to, uh, to to my family and and um, and how quickly that we managed to settle in. Mm. They were very, very generous. Instrumental in that, yeah. Um, and you know, I'm forever thankful for for yeah. He, for spoke their very, support. he spoke very highly of you. I'll tell you a bit later on when we're discussing various aspects and facets of your character um, what he said about you. Um, one of the things that we do, Peter, when we're sort of setting this up, is try and understand what made the person that sits in front of me now, the career that you had, and get a little bit into their background. And yours um, seems to be quite a remarkable background in lots of ways, because given the makeup of your family, given the circumstances that your family found themselves in, um, which is in Poland in the late 1930s, the first world, Second World War breaks out, um, awful experiences for your grandparents, mm -hmm. and ultimately for your father, yeah. um, with his mother being taken away, yeah. as a result of the Russians and their belief systems. Um, and you were born as a, as a, as a, as a Pole, as, as a Polish. I was, yeah, I was actually a Polish uh, citizen yeah. when, when I was, I was, I'm born in Denmark. Um, I, I didn't realize that until many, many years mm -hmm. later. And um, I can't even remember how I found out. But um, when my father passed, I f obviously, I helped out in sort of clearing out his office and stuff. His estate, yeah. And then, and I found, you know, all the documents from 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 back then when he he applied for Danish citizenship in the the end of the sixties, mm -hmm. and he was granted it. And in that uh, granting of citizenship to him, uh, me and my sisters were granted citizenships in Denmark right. as well. Right. You know, but I, I I was actually born Polish. Yeah. But even more remarkable than that, perhaps revelation was the revelation that your father's departure from Poland 
to come to Denmark came with a condition, didn't it? In terms of that he had to work. Yeah. I'm going to use it very a, a very glib statement. You might be able to expand upon it. That he had to to become a spy. He was a spy. Well, yeah. He was a spy at the lowest level you can be a spy at. Um, so my father was uh, he was a musician. Yeah. He was trained in the the royal or the not the royal but the music school in Warsaw, and was employed straight after he graduated. He was employed by the state theatre, the travelling theatre, uh, and ended up in in uh, in uh, in one of the uh, summer villages where people came to in the summer. Very cultural place called Sapo. That's where I met my mother. Right, um, and she would then she would come to and from now and again. And the longest period she had there was about six months. And in that six months, she left pregnant and told my father to make his own way uh, to Denmark. She would, she didn't want to bring kids up in Poland. Your mother's Danish, right? My mother is Danish, yeah. yeah. So she didn't want to bring kids up in Poland. She wanted to go back mm -hmm. to Denmark and, and, and bring, uh, bring kids up or bring her kids up. So uh, she basically said, make your own way. And he, you know, he, he applied and, you know, did everything he could to get out in, in, in what, I don't know if you can describe it as a, a legal way, but, um, and he weren't granted permission to leave. But if he agreed to spy for Poland, he would, he would be given permission. And, you know, being a musician, being an artist, being a cultural person, I mean, that was the furthest away from, from what he could think about mm. himself. So he, uh, he never agreed until the point where he realized, if I don't agree to do this, I'm never going to leave Poland. I'm never going to come up mm -hmm. to Denmark. I'm never going to, they were married at this time as well. I'm never going to get to my wife and, and my kid. So uh, he agreed and he was sent to spy school in, in Warsaw and uh, was, um, yeah, was sent to Denmark via Berlin. That's, when I say via Berlin, it's because that's how I found out. I mean, right. he was never big and talking about his, his time in Poland. He never taught us Polish. Right. Uh, when he eventually got to Denmark, uh, he left Poland behind. Very quickly, he learned the language in Denmark. Um, and he, he, he did his best to become Danish. One of my father's big passions was, uh, was um, boxing. Really? And I was involved yeah. in the Super Six. Remember the Super Six yep. boxing tournament yeah, that yeah. with uh, that was in uh, was it eight mm -hmm. nine something like two thousand nine. But um, uh, and and the first the first match you were was, involved in what capacity? I was uh, I was so the production company that I worked for right was partners with Showtime. Okay. It was actually their idea. They took it to Showtime. So Carl Froch and all that fought on that, didn't they? Carl Froch yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what I did, I was I was presenting the uh, the Danish boxing programs. Oh really? So yeah. Um I by the way I had the the, the great pleasure of of of, uh, of being in Nottingham uh, when um before Carl Froch fought uh, Michael Kessler, the Danish oh, right. guy. Yeah. The second fight. That was a f uh, that was the second fight. Yeah. No, no, no. It was the first one. The first the one, one in Carl Denmark. Lost. Yeah, yeah. The one Carl you lost. lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a brilliant guy he is. And he is. I yeah. mean, wow. So your father liked boxing. So, so I took him to the first fight, which was in in um, in Berlin. Uh -huh. So we were there for a couple of days, and we went for a walk uh, uh, one of the days, and all of a sudden he says, "This has changed," and I'm like, "What do you mean it's changed?" Well, when when I came from Warsaw. They sent me via Berlin. So, and at the time, I was here. They were building the wall. The wall, yeah. They were building it, and mm -hmm. I'm like, whoa. And I didn't want to push it because it was a moment that I, I mean, I really, really wanted to sort of to treasure that moment because he was opening up. So I didn't want to push it. So I left him a little bit, sort of, to his own thoughts, and then he started to talk. So, so everything that I know about about him and his past came from that conversation. Mm. Was it always a goalkeeper for you? Because I spoke to, as I said to you at the beginning of this, I spoke to Steve Bruce, and we'll talk about your your career as you become a, an, an elite goalkeeper. But he talks about your levels as a player. And and there's always this sort of, sort of sly observation that will be made, is that people end up as goalkeepers because they can't play anywhere else. Is there anything in that? Because he felt that you could have played, given the level of ability that you had with a ball, um, that you could have played being an outfield player. Did you end up as a goalkeeper because that's what you wanted to do, 
Or did you end up a goal, as a goalkeeper because nobody wanted to put you in the outfield position? Well, first of all, I so so system in Denmark is diff, diff, different to to England. In England, it's through the schools. But what we do is we we literally just go and join a club, and then we we get put in a team. And right. Most places in Denmark, they they have you know they can facilitate facilitate a team to to any any ages. Even my age now, that there would be a team if I could play. Because this would be the mid seventies, right? This would be the early seventies. Early seventies. Right. So I played my first ever game on August the seventh, nineteen seventy two. So you're nine. So uh, yes, nine. Yeah, eight or nine. Yeah, I'm 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 still eight. Right. I'm getting to nine. I I just joined the team uh, because my friends were doing it. And I didn't have a clue about football. I didn't know the rules. I didn't know what offside was. Back then, we played with offside. We played 11 aside as well. Right. Uh, the times were obviously very, very different. I didn't have a clue. All I played was, you know, uh, just in front of our apartment, you know, on any any piece of grass that you, we you could, could find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never played anything organized. So after about 10 minutes, the coach said, why don't you try to go in goal? Because I probably I was probably a little bit wild, didn't really know what the idea about football was, right. and I went in and and it went well and and not long after that, you know, him and other people were, who watched me play said, "Whoa, you're really really talented. You're really good. You'll end up playing for Denmark." And I was a kid, and and I believed that, you know, it was a grown up. Grown ups are telling me this. So did you automatically enjoy being in goal? I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Were you a big kid? I mean, how tall are you now? How tall are you? Are you six foot four? Yeah, I was. Yeah, you're shrinking like all shrinking. of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah like all of us. Yeah, I, I f I'm not sure. I don't think I was. I was. I wasn't. I was. I, I probably was big, but not the biggest. You know. Right. I was. You know, probably just above above average size for for a kid of that age. What, once you started playing and you started to get some recognition and you can see yourself having the capability for it. Was it a drive of yours to the? This is where I'm going to go. This is what I want to do. I'm going to. I'm going to be a professional footballer. Because given what you've just said about the, your father's uh, propensity to want you to play instruments because of his natural leaning, because he was a musician himself, and you getting a certain level of competence but not wanting to take it to the next level, did it ever worry you if your ambition was to be a footballer that 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 may replicate itself in your football? The crazy thing about that was that from the moment I started to play, that was all I wanted to do. And I really, really wanted to play for Denmark. I really wanted to be a professional footballer. And that, in spite of the job not existing in Denmark, we're, we're, we're in the early 70s here. Yeah. Back then, you could not represent Denmark in any sport as a professional. You had to be an amateur. Right. This was by law. This wasn't... This was not within the sport. This was by law. Right. And that law got changed in 1978. Um, and, and of course, straight away, there, were, there was a football club signing players. You know who the first player ever to sign a contract in Denmark was? Frank Arneson. Bobby Moore. Was it? <laughs> yeah. Oh. He, he signed for Herning. He was the first player to sign a professional contract. Uh, in Denmark, and 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 the first time, the first season of full-time professional football was by one club in 1986. That was Bromby. Bromby went full-time. Right. Uh, I joined the club in 78. Uh, sorry, in 80, 87. So the next year, and I literally had to pay take a you know one-third pay cut to become a professional. And I didn't care. I honestly did not care because the only thing I wanted to do was to play football and be a professional football player. And I knew, you know, if I put all the all the hard work in, did all that made made all the right moves. Applied yourself, yeah. Applied myself to the best possible place, which was Bromby, mm -hmm. that I would have an opportunity to uh, to um, you know make it into Europe. And I, again, uh, I was really up against it because Danish goalkeepers weren't like Perceived that way, not really, yeah. not really. And mm -hmm. and and in all fairness, all I really, really wanted to do was to play for Manchester United. But I was going to ask you that because yeah. it, it, I mean, it says that when you're a kid, you're growing up in Denmark, and all you're doing is looking at Man United. Yeah. And I'm looking at that thinking, why would that be in the seventies? 
United are getting relegated in 1974. They're, 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 the best they've done is win an FA Cup in 77. Liverpool are dominating English football. Why, why Man United? It, it's a really interesting question and I've asked myself that question many, many times um, over the years. But don't forget that I'm born in 63. So, so, so you've seen the 67 team? Well, it, I... I, I probably haven't because, again, I'm growing up in Denmark and it, and we weren't spoiled with football in, in, in Denmark. But my father always claimed to be a Man United supporter. Right. And and not a Man United supporter that would, you know, travel and watch the games. But, you know, he... And I think it comes from what happened in in 58 with the plane crash oh, in right. Puny. Okay. I think he got sympathy for, for he the club. related to it. And therefore, in a way, Manchester United became something in his subconscious, if you like. You so when it came to football, that was a team that he wanted right. to support. Um, and of course, in 68, you know, win the European Cup and, and and the players that are in the team, you know, the names. And again, I have to sort of uh, state that I'm, I'm, I'm from Denmark. Mm -hmm. So these names, Bobby Charlton, you know, George Best, Dennis Law, they, they're special names. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in a way... You know, my father must have spoken or talked about it or whatever. It's they've just been there, and it permeated your psyche. Exactly. Yeah. Going into the realms of 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 your position on the field and talking about goalkeeping, um, it's a unique position, and I think it's beginning to become a much more valued position. Um, and I've got strong views on why Nottingham Forest were successful in the seventies. I think the key signing was Peter Shilton, and it made them kick on from there. But I suppose the overriding question is in, from talking to a great goalkeeper is what what makes a great goalkeeper what are the key attributes of a great goalkeeper well i think it starts somewhere else you you um you have to look at the team that you have well i mean it, i think i think a lot in football and you know this from from having your own football club that that identity is key to everything that you do you if you don't if you don't have an identity if you're not if people don't know who you, who you are, people within the club or within a company don't know who you are, what you're supposed to be and, and, and how you're getting there, I don't think you get anywhere. So when you look at football teams, we, we talk about who's who's the best goalkeeper in the world. I get asked this question all the time and I never answer that question. I go on a long, long explanation about, you know, the team they play in. And I mean this. I really do mean that. And and the greatest example, I, I've used this over the years, uh, was to take the two Manchester clubs when David De Gea was there. Yeah. So if you swap the goalkeepers in those two teams, so David De Gea played for Man City and Edison, went the other and way. Edison played for, for Man United, none of those teams would be able to play the way they played. Right. Because it... So, so Pep's built this team. And, but was that incredible. relatable to your time, though? Because ultimately, it's become, I mean, it's changed now, hasn't it? I mean, goalkeepers, if you look in the 70s, where in this country we were perceived to have the best goalkeepers, mm. Clement, Shilton, Joe Corrigan, Phil Parks, Mervyn Day, a whole raft of goalkeepers, but they got the ball, they booted it up the field, and they stopped people from putting it in the back of the net. That was the perception of a goalkeeper. That was his job. But you're saying that your view is that actually the identity of the team, the way that the team plays, can actually define how great a goalkeeper can be. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to state that the fundamentals has got to be there. Keep the ball out of there. Yeah. Keep the ball out of there. That is your, it doesn't matter what else your job is. You have, that is your first thing. Yeah. Keep the ball out of the net, you know, limit the opportunities for your opponents. That means you have to talk to your defenders. You have to maybe come, you know, it's difficult now, uh, but, you know, come for crosses, control your, your, your box, all of these things for me, are still the most important thing. Yeah. Now, the, the next bit is when we talk about being in possession, you know, when your team have the ball, yes, it's changed a lot. It changed f in my time of playing. First, you know, the back back pass rule changed. Be, you know, in the early 90s, you could actually pick up a ball being passed from, from, a, from a, one of your teammates. Yeah. You could pick it up and hold it, hold on to it. You could hold on to it for about six seconds. You could only it. take three steps. Yeah. You know, and I then, remember, yeah. And then you had to do yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, boot the ball up the other end or whatever. And then it changed, of course. Uh, I think one of the reasons it changed was our European Championship final against Germany in 1992. Right. 
because every time we were in trouble, it didn't, it didn't matter where the ball was, they just turned around and kicked it back to me and the Germany then would have to come back and, you know, we were eating up time. And I think it, you know, I think it was deemed not to be worthy of football. And I liked, I really have to say, I really liked that change. Um, one of the observations that I made about you guys often, and excuse the language, but understand the meaning, is that you got to be a bit of a screw loose because to put yourself in the way of some of the, the confrontations that you have to have to go down at the feet of a striker and, and put yourself in a way of challenges all makes you have a unique mindset. And that's what I'm trying to understand from mm. you about a goalkeeping perspective because it is a unique position. It's different from any other position by its very definition because you're, you're, you're in a position on your own. Mm. It is. It's different. You are, you are the last man there. You, uh, you, so you, you are the the only one in the team that that is not in control of what you have to do. You are completely Re reactive, reactive yeah. to everything that happens, where everybody else at some point can be proactive and you know do stuff. Okay, it's changed a little bit now with goalkeepers being more involved in build up play, mm. but you have to. You have to keep your you you gotta be focused, keep your concentration at all times, um, and then put yourself in the best possible position that you can for when something happens. That means you you gotta predict a little bit, and you have to react. So predict and react is different to to the rest of the team really. And then of course, I and this is this is why I mean I I said this about Bruzy he, he was I mean it was fantastic him and his family mm. helping helping us settling in, but Bruzy and Pally helped me settle in the team, and and you know again I'm internally grateful grateful for that because I had my style of play, they 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 all of a sudden had somebody different behind them they'd never had before I did talk a lot yes I I also who did you replace. Sorry? Who did you replace in United uh, Goal? Different goalkeepers. Jim Layton. Jim Layton. Uh, Gary Walsh. Uh, Les Seeley. They were right. like, yes. Um, so, so, and I, I wanted, I wanted them to defend in a specific way. I didn't like, I absolutely hated being under pressure. Didn't like it. I didn't like it when we were, you know, camped in our box and the ball was flying in and out. And mm. I didn't like that because anything can really happen, you know. It, a slight deflection and then the ball goes there instead of there, and and all of a sudden you're out of balance and you haven't you haven't got a chance of saving whatever comes to you. I like them being further up the pitch. Yeah. And in order for them to 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 do that, they had to absolutely one hundred percent trust my ability. To govern that area behind right. them. When well, he I, said to me, he said there was, you know, this when I was getting, you know, we used to have ding dongs, myself and Peter, and he said there was almost this feeling that if he got a shot on goal, he was aggrieved. He get, it would be very irritated and very irascible with us if we allowed a shot on goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it goes back to something else he said. You know, keeping myself in the game, mm. and uh, and also probably didn't have, I didn't really have. An idea of how to behave. Should I? Should I smile? Should I celebrate? Should I laugh? You know, I don't like. Honestly, I don't like when goalkeepers make a save now and they celebrate. You know, it's like they've scored a goal. What happens in the next moment when they concede a goal? Yeah. Then that moment before they're made to look a little bit stupid. What about they? the idea of goalkeepers? I mean, we see quite demonstrative goalkeepers now. We see. I was always very critical insofar as I have a right to be critical of Joe Hart getting himself revved up before a game to such a point where it almost seemed like he was out of control and we see a little bit of that with Jordan Pickford was that a characteristic that you had and what do you think of those characteristics mm, it I, seems to me I, that you I guys have to do it that way I, I was I mean you know if, if people go back and, and, and watch me from games they will probably see this angry guy shouting all the time and it was very much it was very much designed to one keep myself in the game and keep myself focused secondly i i had uh it was an act a deliberate act to be be conceived as arrogant and annoying to my uh, my opponents um i never acknowledged anyone that i played against i really didn't i tried to completely ignore them and I mean, I, I I come in to a league that had teams like Wimbledon, where you got players like John Fashion and, yeah, yeah. and Vinnie Jones, 
making careers out of annoying people, you know, <laughs> putting them off balance, you know, off guard, and then being very good at, 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 at taking advantage of that moment. Yeah. Not, I mean, people revved up. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a bad way. I always, I always, I taught myself from, from when I was a small kid, I'm the best. I'm the yeah. best. I'm unbeatable. I, 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 I told myself that every time I played, every time in training, and I demanded of myself to be the best. And it was not because of, <laughs> of course, I wanted to be the best. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But it was not because it had any value of being the best in that sense. It was to make sure that I always delivered the best that I could. Yeah, operated I never, I never set out to be the best in the world or the best in the league. I never, uh, and this is the truth, I never ever set out to break records on clean sheets. No. Clean, uh, clean sheets, in a way, didn't really have much value to me unless they were achieved on the day and we won and yeah, all that. Course, yeah. But it was not something, I wasn't chasing records because I didn't care. As long as we won 3-1, I was happy. I was as happy as winning 2-0. And, and and that 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 is how I was, because I grew up in these team environments. I grew up in great, not great, I say great, but at the levels we were at, we were always at the top. You know, it was always you know, first, do, do, second, or third. Do, do you team. think? Do you think that the mental fortitude and the mental resilience of a goalkeeper is greater than that of outfield players? No. Why not? No, I don't think that. I would have thought you would have done. No. It's different. It's just a different thing. But you've only, the only the only structure, the only support you've got your, at times is your own ass. If you if you if you make a mistake, it's in the back of the net. Yeah. A midfielder makes a mistake. There's someone else to come along and pick it up after him. Yeah, but then then he's got to run between the two boxes and you know support the defence, and then he's got to support the strikers, and he's going to create chances. If he doesn't do that, we don't score. If he, he doesn't come back, they is that will what score. you thought all the time? Is that what you think now? I I always thought about that. Yeah. So in so my senior senior years, I mean, I obviously had four years of of playing in Bromby, where we were on uncharted ground. We were, we were new in professional football. We had some incredible results, and I was with a group of players that they all wanted it. They all really, really wanted it. And of course, we, most of those players ended up winning the European Championships in '92. But we wanted it, and we won. I mean, we won the championship every year. We were in the semi-final of the European Cup. We, we, I mean, for a Danish club, this is just mm. these are crazy results, yeah. right? As I said, winning the the, uh, the European Championship with most of those same players in '92, and I know, and I knew back then, and I fully, fully understood that none of that would have happened if we didn't share that same mentality right if we if we didn't all of us individually worked as hard as we could for the benefit of the team and if we set out as individuals to you know if we set out a goal this year i'm going to be player of the year you 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 wouldn't achieve anything for the team that would be all about you obviously you know you go through the gears you play for various clubs in denmark you play for bromby which is now the top club in denmark you get to a european semi-final well i wish it was well, it was at the time, wasn't it? FC Copenhagen, they're in the Champions League still. Bromby is no. You won the league with them, didn't you? We, we, we did. They were. I mean, yeah. Bromby was the first club in Denmark to uh, to go all in on professional football. They yeah. took a chance uh, and they developed, or they, they made the sort of the groundwork for the Danish Super League now, which is, uh, it, it's it's quite, quite well paid. It's mm. not Premier League, of course, but it is for Denmark. It's it's quite it's quite f uh, fantastic, but, but that it, that was Bromby. But it takes you into the op into the world of opportunity, the place that you dreamt about being, which is being in a room with Alex Ferguson, nineteen ninety. Yeah, ninety. No, they've just won the FA Cup. Yeah. So Against no, my Crystal Palace. So, yeah. So. Um, I, I I got. But by I, the way, you, <laughs> how are you sitting in a room with Alex Ferguson in nineteen ninety? Having a conversation about going to Man United if Bromby don't want to sell you. You see, that's that's that what, might be a slippery question of tapping up. That's what happened, you know. Does it? It is what happened. So I'm not. I'm actually not sitting in the room with with uh, with Alex Ferguson. I, I I got approached by an agent, and back then it wasn't it wasn't the norm to have an agent, especially not for a Danish player. This guy approached me and said, "I really I mean, I really want to work with you," and 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 he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said. One thing I want to play for Manchester United. United yeah. So, so uh, he he straight away said I can work with that. He started to work 
uh, Alex Ferguson, um, and you know, keep put. And I know now because uh, he's told me that on many occasions that he he kept sending his uh, his goalkeeping coach, um, uh, Alan Hodgkinson, God rest his soul, to Denmark to 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 look at me, and and Alan told me. Um, <laughs> He's come back after the first time. He said, "You got to sign this kid. He's good." But again, I mean, I was I was a Danish goalkeeper in 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 playing in Denmark, and it was then Danish goalkeepers just didn't get to There's any other clubs yeah. abroad. Yeah. So yeah. it was it was a different time back then. But but then we play England, my first time ever at Wembley, uh, and on the day so, so on the day this is before mobile phones. I'm I'm having my afternoon kip in the hotel and the agent phones me up and say, okay, it's official. They made an official approach for you. There are two other clubs at the same day making official approach for me, approaches for me. So, so Man United, whoa. I'm like, whoa. I take this energy into the game. Um, I'm playing at Wembley for the first time. It's another dream come true. Uh, and I'm just about to have the biggest dream coming true. You know, playing for Manchester United, mm -hmm. they want me. Unbelievable. So, uh, had you spoken to Ferguson this time yet? No, no, I've, no, uh, no. I've seen him because they were in, a, they were sort of a warm weather training in a hotel where we were preseason training. Uh, so I've seen him, and I'm like this, you know. Um, but anyway, I get back to Denmark. The chairman of Bromby phones me up and said, "We've had this approach. What do you want me to do?" I said, "This is what I want to do. Fine." And I never heard from him again about this. Never. Of course, I, I was informed through the agent, you know, that you know the club was asking far too much money, and United you know, weren't prepared to pay that. And and eventually, it didn't happen. So I was devastated. And uh, the agent says, "Listen, it's not dead. They might come back for you. So make sure you're in the best shape." And you. Um, so I started. To you know, work work as hard as I could. I've worked like a madman, and uh, and one day I get a, a phone call before uh, I leave for training. It's again before mobile phones, by the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, and this is someone who uh, who helped my agent. Said he said to me, "Get to my house after training." And 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 I went to his house, and Alex Ferguson was there. That's right. the first time I meet him, and he he he's literally just arrived, straight from the airport. You know, forty-five minutes drive into this house, and he, he he stood up, shook my hand, and said, "You know, I've seen what I want. I'm coming back for you in the summer. Make sure you play well, um, and uh, see you next year." Shook my hand and left, and I'm stood there thinking, "Whoa, what just happened?" Um, so I kind of knew this this would have been sort of September time, right? I kind of nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety. Yeah. I kind of knew yeah. that I was. I was getting to, uh, I was getting my my dream to dream. come true. When you first met him, because it was a different Ferguson then. This is a Ferguson that's been at Man United since 1986. Comes mm. from Aberdeen, right? Comes with a big reputation. What were your first impressions of Ferguson when you first met him? But I, I think he was. To be honest, I, I think he never really changed. I think he was, and this is what uh, Martinet was in his board. They, they bought into him and his mentality and what he wanted to do um i think he refined his way i think he uh, uh, as his teams the football club and the institution of manchester united developed in in uh, at his pace because that's what it was I, I think he developed with them but he never changed as a person even, never at all even this day today and i would say this and i mean this he's the nicest man you'll ever meet he is the nicest man, and I could not have wished for a better manager to to uh, to work under the under the pressure that it is to be a Manchester United yep. player. This guy was brilliant in every department. Yes, he was tough at times, but he was also kind and nice, and an arm around the shoulder. I've never experienced for all of the years I've known him. I've never experienced him not having time for me. I spoke to him the other day. What? Not yeah. even. Gonna, I'm going to ask you this question about your altercation with him. You have a you have a major altercation with him in '94 because there's two things. Yeah, First I of did. all, no, from what I understand, you put your United your United career in jeopardy there. 
how, how do you get involved in a, in, in, in a major confrontation with Alex Ferguson? No, but if it's, if, this, this game, uh, this, I'm just, I think what you have to understand is that I I came off the pitch. We were we were 3-0 up in no time and we should have been 7-0 up and we ended up drawing 3-3. Three, three. And I kind of felt that I kept us in for the for the one point. Um for some reason we just stopped playing. You know, you don't do that in Anfield. And and so you you get, you know, uh, temperament, you get feelings, you get everything mixed in. Uh and you don't get time to cool off before you get into the dressing room. And mm. then it's me that's been picked on. I was one, I mean, I got picked on a lot. And you've spoken to Bruce this morning. Bruce got picked on a lot. You know, Inzi got picked on a lot. I mean, by the manager. By the manager. Yeah. Pally. Is that because you're the strongest characters in the dressing room? Because, because right. of that. And I understood that. I've been I've been there long enough by this time to understand that. But on this day, my brain is just fried up, you know, completely. And I just couldn't take it. Why me? I mean, look around. I'm thinking, look, you can you could you could do that to literally everyone in here, but not me, because I, I kind of kept us in it. That was my feeling, right? And that's why maybe I I I ended up to and this is just one thing. It's one thing out of eight years. You know, it's one thing, and he, you know, he calls me into the office at the the next time we meet, which is on the Monday. This is a but what Saturday. did you say to him in the dressing room? You, you've blown, oh, no, you've no. blown up him. You see, th this is it. I go as far as say you. Know, I said very, very things I shouldn't have done, but I'm one of these guys. I I think whatever happens in the dressing room stays in the dressing room. You know, we're all we all you know after games, training, whatever. We all have you know different. Um, ways of dealing was with Was he challengeable? It, because the perception yeah, of Ferguson was, is... He's, that's what I'm, I, I, he's okay, brilliant. Put, put aside the nuance of what but, you did but, and didn't say, but what, as a manager, the perception of Ferguson is, this is what you do. You do as you're no. told, and if you don't do it, you get out the door. You have to yeah, stand no, that, baby that, Beckham, that, whoever else. But that is right. two different things. That's two really, really different things. So, could you argue against him? All the time. Was he looking for... In front of others? All the time. In front of others, in front of the dressing room, right, all the time. In a way, he respected you, but you had you to be right. Back. But you had to be right. Only this one time, only this one time was the wrong time, right? I I didn't realize it, and yes, I know why it's out there because I put it out there in my, yeah, yeah, in my book myself, and and and. But the reason I put it out in, in my book was in many ways to take responsibility for that because that was that was very very stupid, but it's also in a way to 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 give an example of why this guy is so unique, mm -hmm. why Sir Alex Ferguson has achieved what he's achieved. Because he calls me into the office in the, the, the next time we're in, which is Monday morning, and he says, you were out of order, and uh, you know I have to let you go. And at this time, I'm still not understanding completely that that I am in the wrong here. You know, I still feel very, feel very, very hurt about me being blamed for mm -hmm. this, you know. Um, so so I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. So he goes, <laughs> he goes, uh, but you're still playing. I'm, you know, okay, fine, you know. And I go, when? I don't know when, he says. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm, and it kind of sort of, he takes the edge of what he's saying. Mm. But he's also making a good point. So anyway, very rarely did we have a meeting in in our uh, training ground dressing room. Very, very rarely. But of course, in this day, this is the first day after the three three draw against Liverpool. It was three nil up. We are going to have a meeting, of course. And he's angry. Of course, he's angry, and he plays his part, which is good. He's he's playing that really, really well. Says nothing about me. Just you know what he has to do. Fine. See you, see you on the pitch. And he leaves. And I, I then go, wait, guys, um, I just want to say, I, I really, I'm sorry about whatever I did on Saturday. I embarrassed you. I embarrassed the manager. I apologize to the managers. You know, I also want to apologize to you guys because I was really out of order. And off we go training. I never hear anything about this sacking ever. But he's told my agent that he, uh, he, he was listening by the door. And he said, okay, I didn't expect that. Mm. 
okay, forget about it. Yeah, change his mind. But in a way, what, what he's doing here is just making points. Mm. And it was, okay, I was used as as a guy, mm. but he's making points to everyone. And it's the same thing when he went, when he did his post mass interviews or pre match, whatever, mostly post mass interviews, a lot of what he said was said to us, yeah. not to the media. Psychology. Yeah. Mm. So, and and working with him, you understand this. And of course, being away from from uh, from football for so long, and you know, you've gone through all the badges and you, you kind of, it takes you back and you understand it much, much better. But I will say this again. He is the best manager that I could ever, ever wish to work with. He, he made me play 100% every time. That's how he gets maximum out of did you fear every him? player. Did you fear he him? Because he trusted every player. Fear him. Did you fear there's him? There's nothing man? to fear. No, I'm just asking you. No. The nothing. perception is that he's fearful. No. Again, I, I would say this again because I, I don't think it's been said enough. He's the nicest person you'll ever meet. If... If you were not doing what you're supposed then to you do, then you suffer the consequence. Of course, yeah. But that's a good that's a good boss. That's isn't a standard, it? isn't it? Because that's not just that's not that's not disrespecting him or the football club. That's also disrespecting the football team, mm. and that's what you're there for. You're there to play in the football team, and and that football team is is there for the fans. So we have great responsibilities yeah. to 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 them. And therefore you have to, and especially with a club like Manchester United, and we see this more and more these days, the responsibility that you have is so heavy. If you can't deal with it, it's there for the whole world mm -hmm. to see. Eric Cantona, I mean he comes to Manchester United and I mean I always thought he was a remarkable signing because I thought he was an outstanding player at Leeds and there's lots of reasons why people suggest he left Leeds but that's not for this discussion. Um, but he comes to Manchester United and a lot. Of, I, I would say he's a riddle wrapped up in an enigma um, but he's a game changer in some ways, isn't he, yeah. for United? Yeah. In what way? So if you think about the team we had when he when he arrived, so... The team was pretty much the same every game. So it would be Paul Parker right back, then then the Brucey Palace, the Denny Irvin. You would have Giggs or Sharp on the right. Yeah. Also on the left, Can Chelsea's on the right. Then you'd have uh, Paul Innes and and Brian McClay in the middle, and you would have Mark Hughes with who up front, you know, mm. Mark Robbins. It could be you know various different players. And the team was very because of because of the wingers because of Sharp and Giggs on the left and Kanchelskis on the right. It was very much a sort of winging, a wide playing team. You know, you get to crossing position, get the ball in the box, and and I think he felt the manager felt that he needed in order to break the dark needed something else that was not so English in its setup. So he needed to to have something playing down the middle needed to have more play going down the middle. And he's looking at Canton. I'm sure he's been looking at him from when he arrived at Leeds and thinking, wow, I want this player. And of course, we all know it's a coincidence on, on the timing because um, Leeds wanted Dennis Irvin back. And and uh, and he said, no, you can't have Dennis Irvin, but can I have Canton? It was yes, straight away. Mm -hmm. And then the next day he was there. But yes, it was the one thing. So he was a... He was the final piece in the jigsaw, for absolutely sure. I when I remember when I signed, I got told by Martin Edwards that you are the final piece in the jigsaw, and I thought, and I I kept thinking that all of that season, not 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 thinking that it it's me that has changed it, yeah. but the, the last bit of the development of this team was the goalkeeper, and and of course we didn't win the last two weeks. We uh, we messed it up. Uh, and didn't win the championship, which I thought we should have done. And then Eric arrives, and all of a sudden, we have a completely different way to play in as well as what we've already shown as our great strength. So we were quick in turning the game around. We the pace we had on the wings, you know, the understanding of of the strikers being in the right position for the crosses. All of a sudden, you have this guy who can play little one twos, and you could actually play him in any way, and he would keep the ball. So we had two guys, Mark Hughes and Eric up there. So one, once we got the ball, could we get it to him or to Mark Hughes straight away, which we were used to. But now we had two. Could we get it up there? Then, of course, with the pace we had, we can get up there and we could always be a man more. 
and I mean, my God, he straight away comes in and he changes everything. But I think the most important thing that he did when he first arrived was Eric's a shy guy. He's very, very shy, comes into the dressing room and we all know what it's like to come into a new workplace. So he sits there and he's he hasn't really, he doesn't really know what to do. So what he does is he he takes a ball and he goes out onto the pitch. And at the cliff training ground behind one of the goals is there's a wall, a brick wall. And, and he he starts sort of to, to kick the ball up against the wall, half volleys, volleys, chest it down, you know. And and the cliff training ground, uh, the canteen, the coaches' room, and the physios all had windows facing that pitch. And everyone was looking at him thinking, what? No one's ever gone out training half an hour before training, you know? No one's ever done that. What is he doing? And don't forget, he comes in with a reputation of being, you know, different. You know? Maverick. Yeah. Oh, he's, you know, it's, you know. So there was a little bit of a smirk, sort of a little bit of a laugh. <laughs> I would say, you know, <laughs> what a guy, what a funny guy, you know. But then all the young players started to do the same. So what he did was, by, by being shy and doing that, he actually ended up building on on the next generation's mentality. And then, of course, we all know what he did on the pitch. Were you chairman of uh, Crystal Palace on that day? In 95? No, I went to the game. I watched the game. So did I. Yeah, you, yeah, you would have done. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, but, Bruce, Bruce has told me about that yeah. and said that the dressing room, everyone walked back in and, and Steve, yeah. in his own way, mm -hmm. because Steve describes things a certain way, we all sat there and went... He, Eric was the manager's favourite. Eric got given mm. special dispensation. Eric got allowed to behave in a certain way, but everybody knew that Eric had sort of stepped yeah. up to a point now where there was trouble ahead. Yeah, we all knew that it was um, it was bad. I I got a lot of sympathy for uh, for Eric. I I do. I mean, well, he says it himself now. The only, Matthew the only, Simmons yeah. That's the guy's was name, a yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was out of order. Yeah. Was out of order and should never have done what he did. Um and and he got dealt with. He did? Yes. Eric got dealt with as well. Yeah. Um but you don't do that. I mean, I can't tell you how often I wanted to do the same. You know, we get what and I'm so close to the to the to the supporters all the time. And the abuse you get and the, the things that people they they um finding themselves to say to another person it's sometimes it's just staggering you know mm. i also understand that you know a football for, for a lot of football for most football fans it's their life and a lot of them they're living really really tough lives and they spent a very very large proportion of their budget in order to support mm. their team and it's a, it's a 90 minutes of of being free of everything. Absolutely. And and therefore, I also accept that things have been said, things have been sung, all of that, because it's it is is that a free space. But there is a line. There's a line you cannot cross. And and um, that line was crossed that day. Eric and that day just reacted like anyone, anyone would have done, apart from jumping into the crowd mm. but he was really insulted and he took his i mean he i think the way he took his punishment i think that was brilliant it was brilliant he he he, he uh that, what were your what were you guys reaction i mean i, I mean i've seen footage of it and obviously yeah. i was at the game um and i remember seeing it and and but you guys in the dressing yeah. room when you sat there after the game what was it a one or draw yeah yeah um we're one nil up as well i think yeah uh, green and and yellow, green and gold shirts, right? I think it was an was awful it? kit, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah awful kit. Um, but Steve talks about the dressing room, and everyone's sort of sitting there going, "Wow, was it was it like that? Was it as big a deal to you guys, it's, or was um, it just a moment in time?" And the media turns it into a situation, and it gets it gets elevated, and it gets elevated, and all of a sudden, Canton is facing a custodial sentence. Yeah. Um. So, so when I earlier on said about the dressing room, you know what what happens there stays there. I've 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 seen people who are in the dressing room come out with different versions of events of events mm -hmm. um, that I don't recognise. 
One version is that that the the managers come in and he's oh he's gone absolutely berserk on everyone but Eric. That's that's not my recollection. My my recollection is uh or my, my recollection is that it was just dead and quiet and very very confused. Mm. And you have, I mean, you you know the ground better than anyone. Mm. I mean, th- there there is a corridor outside the dressing room which is very very, very small narrow, and yeah, narrow. Yeah. So you have Morris Watkins, the manager. You have the chairman. You have um, the Michael Edison director. You have all of them huddled together. But they couldn't do that in the corridor because, you know, no room. So they were actually in the dressing room, literally not knowing what to do. And of course, why Why would you know? I mean, do you have a contingency plan for that? No. I'm not sure you have. You know, what, what do you do here? I think everyone realized that this, this would be this would be more than football. Absolutely. Um, so what they did next was going to be very important. And I think that that's my recollection there is that that's what happened. You know, we, we just sat there very, very confused, very, um, and it was quiet. I think he, he knows. I mean, I know he knows that what he did was wrong. He couldn't change it. But I think what how he handled it and how he did it, it, it afterwards dignified. We're dignified. Yeah, interesting to see that he he says the other day. I saw him say the other day or on an interview that um, my only regret is I didn't hit him hard enough. Yeah. Right. But talking about <laughs> recollections and and experiences, I want to talk to you about your relationship with Roy Keane. Um, and I want to read you a quote from Roy Keane to see what your reaction to it is, which is Peter Schmeichel was a poser. He fancied himself in a big way and played to the crowd. It was all about him. All the figure, all the finger pointing and gestures of frustration were designed to convey a message to the fans. Look at me. How much longer can I go on performing miracles to save this team? This was an act, mostly, but we didn't really mind, mostly because his pose was part of what he had to do to G himself up. And then you've got another one from Paul Parker that says, you're a little bit of a coward. He was loud, but he wasn't always ready to front up. When you listen to those... <laughs> What do you what what do you what do you make of them? One's from a book, isn't it? I I, I think they've been given to me. I'm reading them to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, because so it's I, an I interesting dynamic. Because Keen is an interesting character. You're an interesting character. And I these hope are I st- helped these... sell, uh, selling books. I hope that quote helped a little bit. But what do you think of it? No, I mean, I see. I I I brought a book out two years ago. Uh, I I bring I put nothing of that sort in because I don't think it. Uh, I, I don't think I need to, uh, again, it's the same thing opening up the dressing room. don't think I have to do that. I, it doesn't sit right with me because we all, we all have different ways of... of, of but he's being... not talking about conversations no, in a no, dressing no, room, me, is he? Me, he's talking about, you, you, question, you talk about so a team and yeah. you talk about no, your responsibility no, and understanding no, I, your identity. He's calling you a poser and saying yeah. that you aren't about the team. Paul Parker. You're about, no, yeah. P- Roy Keane. Yeah, okay. The, you aren't about yeah, the team, you're but, about yourself. Yeah, but I'm not. Well, that's that's why I'm throwing it at you because but, that's a polar opposite to what you said. Yes, I I don't understand why people have the need to to uh, to to open up the dressing room. I said this before for the reason that when you are at a place like Manchester United, we've covered this before with the pressures that you're on, the responsibility you have. You all have your own individual way of dealing with that, all right? And for some players, it might be this thing, and then it might be that thing for another player, and maybe that player doesn't accept the other player's way of dealing with it. But at the end of the day, we do celebrate those trophies together. Sure. And that is, at the end of the day, the most important thing. So... The observations, that, because I don't, I don't, I understand what you're saying, and I understand the reasons why you're saying it, and there's, there's dignity in what you're saying. But someone keenly saying these things about you, and I know that this is a, a, a trigger subject and potentially one that people will be engaged with. So I'm going to push you a little bit harder on it because you must look at that and listen to it and think, with due respect, for want of a better expression, Roy Keane's talking shit. You must think that. I don't think anything. You I'm, must think that. No, if, so, if someone sits there and think, says to me, I'm a poser and I'm a coward, right? 
I'd have a view on it. If I, if your, if your whole attitude and outlook is that everything I did, I'd done to my responsibility. I understood my, my the mechanics of what I needed to do. It was all about the team. It was all about a culture of being all for one and one for all. And then you've got the captain of this team at that time, um, and a very outspoken individual specifically today saying that you're, you're a poser. It must be something that you either think is absolute nonsense or has some substance. It's one or the other. Yeah, but I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about that because I don't think I don't think it's impo uh, important enough to talk about it. I don't think it's important enough. It's an opinion and people have opinions. It, it's it's what it is. I think at the end of the day what really is important here is that what we achieve together. What do you think of um as a as a as a former Man United goalkeeper, the fourth, you are the number 11th goalkeeper for clean sheets in the Premier League. The fourth in terms of your percentage of clean sheets against games. I think Czech and uh, Pepe Reina and um, Van der Zaar, I think it's Van der Zaar might be in front of you in terms of the percentage of games they kept clean sheet sheets in. So you're the fourth, right? When you look at United now with Onana, mm. what do you make of him? I think it's I think it would be difficult for anyone coming in goal for Man United. <clears throat> Again it's we talked about clarity earlier on. Why why do you bring uh, Andre Onana in? Well, he, his ability with his feet is incredible. We saw that with Inter last season. Um but that was well driven, uh, drilled into that team. That was a clear system of how they played. That was a a clear way that he was uh, contributing to, to, to the team. Um, and he's come into a lot of confusion. So how how are how is the team playing? Are they are they supposed to play it out from the back every time? Are the players good enough to play it out? Is the system well drilled enough to play the ball out from the back all the time? Well, I, I don't think it is. I think a lot of things has uh, sort of hampered that sort of development. Um, of course, I injury to injuries to a lot of the, of, of the defenders. There's a lot of defenders injured. Mm. So it's it's been difficult. For, I, 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 I haven't got the number in my head, but the pairings in front of him is, I think he's got about... 12 or 14. The question I'm going to ask you, and you're probably going to try and skillfully avoid. Probably, um, yes. Is, um, do you think he's got the chops to be a goalkeeper at Man United? You know, we, we, we had David De Gea come in, um, and for a period of time he was criticised and couldn't come and collect, couldn't catch balls and learn how to play in the English mm -hmm. game, and then had a long period of time where he was a top goalkeeper. This guy's come in to replace De Gea, and he's into a barrage of criticism. And I understand what you're saying, which is um, he's playing in not in front of a settled back four. There's this, there's that, and the other. At the end of the day, there is an overriding, overarching question, which is, is he good enough to do his job if, at Man United? If you were the chairman of Crystal Palace now, would you sign him? Well, that's that's like comparing apples of oranges, no, isn't it's it? Not. That's levels. But not, no, no, hold on, you. You can't no, no, you can't no, no. you can't draw a parallel a fair, between Crystal Palace question. and Man United. I'm asking. No, I just not. want to see where you no, are. No, it's on not this because you've said it yourself. Playing for Man United is a whole different set of rules, from the immediate intrusion to the expectation to the aspiration to the absolute outlook of this football club. And you have to have a certain type of personality. You know it. You did it. I don't need to tell you this, right? So he not only has to have the technical ability, he has to have the balls and the mental fortitude to understand the responsibility of playing for Man United. So it's irrelevant if I was the chairman of Crystal Palace whether I'd sign Andre or Anana because he hasn't got to play in front of that level of expectation and with that level of scrutiny. He farts and everyone's going to hear about it, right? Because of Manchester United. So when you look at him as as a, a former elite goalkeeper, as the goalkeeper that left Man United after winning the treble, and as a, as as an influential as a person that was signed to be the final part of a jigsaw, when you look at Andre Anana, do you say to yourself, "I think this kid's going to be all right," or I do you or is. do you fear for him? I hope uh, I I followed him in um, for Inter last season in the Champions League. And I was quite impressed with him. So I know it's there. Yeah, they all were. That's when I signed him. But now, no, in, but but I, now it's I, I know, United, I know it? it's there. Uh, 
the goalkeeper is still part of the team. Don't forget that. I understand so, that. So whatever happens in the team will have a, a reflection on the goalkeeper's performance. Yes, it's a different position. It does different things and you're required to do different things. But if your team's not working, the goalkeeper won't work. Any little insecurity with the pressures, it's going to take off your performances. And I think he was incredibly unlucky in the first Champions League game against Bayern away to make the mistake he made. That mistake has kind of, it's made his reputation. Cascaded. Yeah, and yeah. That, that, is, that is what people are looking at now. I spoke to him after that game. I spoke to him and and he was he was incredibly sad. In fact, so I work for CBS on the game and I do post match interviews. And I got Andrew Ward, who's the director of communication for Man United, coming up to me and say, Andrew wants to speak to you. So he comes in on his own and he wants to apologize. And I get that. I love that. I love the fact that he came out and took responsibility for that mm. on his own. I didn't have to drag him in there. Nobody from the media had to drag him in to do an interview. He was quite prepared to do that himself. So he did that. I then went on to do a couple of other interviews. And then I met up with him again as he's leaving. And I said to him, you know, playing for this football club requires something. I've seen you at Inter. I know you have it. So don't don't take anything that you will read in the next couple of days for anything other than it's what happens. The art of being a goalkeeper for Man United is that you do make mistakes, and we all do. We've all made mistakes. Everyone has ever been in goal for Man United has made a mistake. The art is that the next second it's forgotten about. Mm. You simply take it and put it away and move on to the next moment. If you don't, you will make a mistake in the next moment. So I said this to him. And then after the game, when, you, when, when you're trying to go to sleep at night, you know, whatever, you know, play it through, through your mind again, you know, think about what, where were you, what, you know, how was your balance, all of these things. And then if you have an opportunity to take it into the training session the next day or the next time you train and, and trying to sort of replicate it and see if if that's another way of doing it. Or you come up with a different solution, then try that out. I used to do that. I make mistakes in every game and and, and not every time it costs a goal, but you know, you 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 get out and, and, and you know to a ball where probably it would have been better if Brucey dealt with it or mm. you know, you, you sort of you, you create a little bit of confusion. You do do something, you know. Um and then I would think about that. Okay, that wasn't great. So what what should I have done instead? And uh, I would come up with this solution. Then I would try to put that into training, into practice, just to see if it works, my solution works. And that's what I said to him. Um, and then, of course, we we had the um, the next game was the Galatasaray yeah. at Old Trafford. And, of course, we lost that game. And uh, I went up to him after the game. I've done all my interviews, and he was stood there in the, in the tunnel. And I, went, I, was, I spoke to him for about half an hour, and I just said the same thing, and I just kept saying it. And and he was at this point he's so he's so insecure because he's now feeling what Manchester United is. It's that pressure down on your shoulders, mm -hmm. right? And it's difficult sort of to get up from that. And I said, you just just relax about it. Think about where you are. Think about what it is you're doing and just try to do better. But you have to forget when you can see the goal, you have to get it straight away. You cannot take it into the next moment. And I can see in one of the goals you conceded today. You did bring it on. It is. It it created something. You did something immediately after that is not in your game. You can't do that. You have to stay strong. So, I, I mean, I I don't know what to say. If if you ask Andre himself, are you happy with your first six months of Manchester United? I assume that he says no. I can do a lot better, and we've seen him do better. Um, we've signed him. We sign him because he can do better. We know we can do better. Um, so I hope I hope that he's going to do better. But I'm not going to put put you know all the responsibility on his shoulders because I think that would be so wrong. I think the team hasn't functioned. There's a lot of things that hasn't been great there. And if you are in that environment, it's difficult. It's mm. just difficult because every day you're dragging yourself in and. It's just really, really tough. And today, it's, 
I think today it's worse to be in that kind of environment. It's it's worse than it was when I played because today you have social media, and when you have social media, you can, yeah, you can not look at it. It's a good idea, but it means that it doesn't mean the same as everybody you know doesn't look at it because they will and they will they will ask you about it. You know, so if there was a if a, if somebody wrote some but something bad about me in an English newspaper, my friends in Denmark wouldn't see it. You know, so it would be out so of my no, world. Yeah. Now it would. They would see that and mm. they'd come back to me and then I'd start to think about it. So you, it's just going round and round and round. And I think he suffered a lot for, for how the team has performed. And and I, I hope that they, you know, there's all the players are coming back and things are going to be a bit more settled and then he will settle. And then I think from that moment then on... you judge him. Yeah, then yeah. I think we, we, we can start talking about, is he good enough or is he not? Do you expect United to recover? I mean, this has been 10 years of, I would say, I, I think the worst period, and I know he's one of your mates and he's in your team and it never comes out of the dressing room, but I think the worst period was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. I thought that was a degrading of Man United standards. And 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 I look at them as, a, as, as I said to you earlier on, the poster boys of Premier League. They are the poster boys, whether it's because you were there or Beckham was there or, or you won the treble or you won and Ferguson was an iconic figure, but it's all-encompassing, powerful Man United, dominating English football with great rivals, but they're the poster boys. That's what everyone looks mm. at, Manchester United. Do you think they're going to recover this ground? That, you've, that you've, ne the... you've now got bigger, you've now mm. got Manchester City. You've now and they're different guys. Not the, the rivalry of Liverpool and the rivalry of Arsenal was one thing, but you've now got this irresistible force in Pep Guardiola that will change at some point because he'll go. They've got huge resources, so you can't beat them financially anymore. You can't beat them on the pitch. You can't beat them for lure. But do you think United, in a reasonable amount of time, I spoke to Edward Ray 18 months ago. I said, "Do you think you're going to win the Premier League in the next five years?" And he said, "Definitely," as he departed out the door. Do you think United will win the Premier League in the next five years? Um... It's a really good question. It's it's a question I would have liked to have said yes straight away. Uh, I won't say yes straight away. I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think what is really, really positive here is that now is an opportunity. I talk a lot about identity. I work in the media as well as you do. If I'm, if I'm asked about Manchester United's identity or the culture, I don't know. I absolutely don't know. I don't know who we are anymore. Because you can't recognise it to what it was, right? It was built up by one man who added on slowly year on year on year on year on year. And then he left. And then we think we think that we can just get somebody in to do it. I disagree with Ollie. And of course, you you expect me to disagree with Ollie. Yeah. I don't think it was the worst thing. I think, I think there's a couple of others that were even worse. The guy that came after him. You know, was well, well Ralph Reniak. You've been out mean, fifteen minutes, but still, what you can do in fifteen minutes, you know, can have uh, a really bad influence on what happens in the next five years. I think a couple of the big name managers that came in, they well, came, Mourinho and Louis Van Gaal, but they came in for themselves, and that's how they worked, and and I respect that, and 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 both of them have achieved great resolves of being who they are and sticking to their principles. And But you can't come in and change Man United to suit your style. You have to respect the football club and what the football club is made of. So for all of a sudden, you don't have a supply line through the academy because it's not interesting for any of them. They know they're going to be in the job two, three, four years. So they're not going to spend time on that. They're only going to spend time on the first team. And they make that team the all-important thing of, of a football club, which has always been more than that. And and with that disappears a lot of, of the roots, if you like. A lot of the roots, it becomes unimportant to become a Manchester United Academy player because no one gets through the academy to the first team anymore. I, I, I never, I never thought that we were right in being a club that just bought the players. Never. I always, it always sat a little bit wrong with me. And also realizing when Sir Alex left, realizing that coaches always want their own players in. 
they, they never come in and want to work and develop with the players the that are there. Yeah. They want their own players in. So all of a sudden, you have so many players, and some of them done done well in certain leagues, but they come into Manchester United with a coach that doesn't know what it means to be a Manchester United coach. And all of a sudden, you have a lot of players there that are not good enough to play in the mm -hmm. team because it's different, Manchester United. So I hope all of this is going to change, but it's going to take a little bit of time, you know, develop them into proper, proper Manchester United players. So the last question then is, for this, given it's the subject matter of Manchester United, and we're finishing it on this last question, do you see Man United, within the next five years, winning the Premier League? <laughs> that is a question that cannot be answered today. Unless they do the right things. No, they can't because I don't know. I don't know what the new plan is going to be. If it if it's status quo, I don't think so, no. But if there are changes, there might be a slight chance, yes. Time will tell. Peter Schmeichel. Time will tell. Very much enjoyed seeing Thanks, you today. Simon. Thank you for being so upfront. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly. <laughs>